Hello, I'm Bobby Whiteside, and for those of you online and in person at our Avert campus, welcome. I have a few announcements for you. The first one is regarding communion. For those of you that are in person here as you exit the sanctuary today, we've already prepared for you a cup with both bread and juice. For those of you that are online, this would be a good time to set aside some bread and juice to take at the end of the service. Regarding offering, there are a lot of different ways here to give at Greener Christian Church and support our mission. You can give online, you can give through the app like my family does, and if you don't have the app, now would be a good opportunity to download that, or you can give um, in person at the offering bucket. Next steps. If you have questions about baptism, questions about Jesus, or you want to get more involved with Greenwood Christian Church, please hop on over to greenwoodchristian.com slash next steps. Now join me and let's worship together. Please stand as we worship this morning.
Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Greenwood Christian Church. You can have a seat. I want to welcome everybody who's joining us via our online campus, those who are here with us in person. Uh, we are glad as we celebrate this Christmas season that we get the opportunity to do that together. Now, one part of that celebration will be next Sunday, which is one of our favorite Sundays here in Creative Arts. It is Ugly Christmas Sweater Sunday next week. So, uh, if you've got an ugly Christmas sweater, whether you are here with us in the room or you join us from your couch at home, uh, we want to encourage you to wear your very favorite ugly Christmas sweater next week. It's just always a ton of fun uh, for us as a church to do that together. I might offer her just one caution. Uh, if you don't have an ugly Christmas sweater, that's totally cool. But I, I maybe just wouldn't wear a sweater next week. You know, I would hate for like an embarrassing moment where someone's like, oh man, that's an amazing ugly Christmas sweater. And you're like, no, it's a sweater. <laughs> it's just just a, just a sweater. So anyway, so next Sunday, that is going to be a ton of fun. And then just a few days after that, we've got our Christmas Eve services around here, and we are looking so very forward to those. Uh, we'll have services at 2.30, at 4, and at 5.30 that day. We'll have those uh, in person. We'll have those online. Um, as is typically uh, the case for us, we're going to start with a big element that we think is going to be a lot of fun. And so don't be late, whether you're logging in with us or here in person. Uh, we're just looking forward to a ton of fun uh, together for Christmas Eve. We've got a Facebook event you can invite people to. We've got an invitation cards out in the commons. Uh, we're looking forward to just a, a great day together to just celebrate just this hope that we have, and we are looking very, very forward to that. Speaking of things, we get the opportunity to celebrate. Uh, we had another baptism this week uh, with our Greenville Christian School on the other side of the building, and so take a look at this video. I chose to get baptized today so that I could be closer with the Lord no matter what happens, and for the rest of my life and in sixth grade that I could be closer to the Lord no matter what happens. Alexis is on fire for God. She is a sweet girl, she's loving, and she is absolutely in love with Jesus and ready to dedicate her entire life to Him. Um, so Alexis, I'm going to have you repeat some things after me today, okay? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I now accept Him. Now I accept Him. As my personal Lord and Savior. Now as my personal Lord and Savior. Because of this confession, Alexis, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and eternal life.
count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. have had some pretty dark, deep valleys this year, had some days where our hearts are really, really heavy. And God, we know, we know in our minds that this is a season of hope and this is a time that we can focus on the birth of your son, God, but we ask you, we ask you to come into our lives and our hearts and our minds and fill us with your spirit in the midst of this season where we cry out for answers, God. May we find all of those in you. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat.
morning. Well, my name is Matt, and whether you are connected with us online or you're here on campus with us, I want to welcome you this morning. I'm really glad we have the opportunity to be together. And our very first order of business today is a bit of a public service announcement, just a reminder that punctuation matters. I mean, you can say, like, welcome, Matt, or you can put out a welcome, Matt. But if you want to be hospitable without getting walked on, you should use a comma. Um, last Saturday night, we had some friends over for dinner, including Jason and Elizabeth Weatherholt. Now, suppose that Jason had arrived at our front door and had caught me on the couch with a golden retriever on my lap. I might have said something like, come on in. You know, I would get up and say hello, but as you can see, I can't stand, Jason. <laughs> but without commas, I could only say I, I can't stand Jason. And that isn't true most of the time. Um, well, punctuation is a difference between let's eat grandma and let's eat grandma. Or how about I like cooking my family and my pets. <laughs> punctuation matters. Now this is our second week in a series called Why Jesus. And I want you to notice there is no comma in the title of this series. We're not asking why Jesus is life so hard. We're exploring why Jesus. Jesus came. I mean, why we even celebrate Christmas. Last week, Cody stressed to us that Jesus came to bring light into the darkness of our world. And today we're going to focus our energies on a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples in Mark chapter 10. Mark 10 verse 32 says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. So Jesus and his disciples were heading toward Jerusalem. Now, why were they headed toward Jerusalem? Well, because that's where Jesus would ultimately fulfill prophecy by being crucified. Jesus led the way because he was fully committed to his mission. He was all in. Now, at this point in the Gospel of Mark, this is about two-thirds of the way through the entire book, Jesus had already predicted his own death twice. So the disciples were astonished because even knowing what was about to happen... Jesus was still going to Jerusalem. His other followers were also afraid of what was about to take place. Well, again, meaning a third time now, Jesus took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him, three days later, he will rise. Now, if there had been any doubt at all before this moment what awaited Jesus in Jerusalem, he had just cleared that up. I don't want you to mention any names right now or point any fingers, but do you know any chronic interrupters? And I don't mean that person who, who barges into a meeting to let you know that the building is on fire. I'm talking about that person who sort of obliviously assumes that whatever it is they have to say at any given moment is always more important than the conversation you're already engaged in. You know what I'm talking about? They, it's like they spot you across the room and you can sort of see the, the wheels turning. I can see you're already talking with somebody, so this seems like as good a time as any for me to butt in and tell you what I've decided to do for vacation next summer. Do you know any people like that? We all have maybe a few of those in our lives. Well, that's sort of how I picture this conversation going down. Verse 35 says, Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now remember, Jesus had just explained that he was about to be arrested and ridiculed and beaten and executed. Serious stuff, right? So what better time to barge in and ask Jesus for some special privileges? I mean, Jesus, that's a bummer about you dying and all, but we want you to do us a favor, okay? Would you tell the rest of these guys that we are the most important? Pretty clueless, right? Well, you don't know what you were asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. But like Jesus said, James and John really didn't understand what they were signing up for here. The cup was a, an Old Testament metaphor. It's used several times as a symbol of God's wrath. The, the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Habakkuk all use that image. 
The word baptism is sometimes a symbol for just being submerged in or flooded over by troubles. So Jesus wasn't offering his disciples a, a cool drink. He wasn't offering them a, a refreshing dip in the Jordan River. He was hinting at the pain and suffering that awaited him and them. Well, Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. In other words, Jesus said, James and John, places of honor are really the least of our worries right now. First, you're going to have to face some real hardship. Well, verse 41 says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And we don't know for sure whether the other disciples were irritated by this request that James and John had made or just kicking themselves that they didn't think to ask first. But Jesus sees this as a teachable moment. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. See, Jesus knew exactly where his disciples' ambitions had come from. Everywhere they looked, it's really no, no different for us, right? Everywhere they looked, people were grabbing for power, trying to get themselves a little more into the spotlight. Everybody wanted to be large and in charge but that is not at all what Jesus had in mind for his disciples. So he said, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. On my team, Jesus said, everything is upside down. Enough with the selfies, guys. You can cut out the smack talk. Self-promotion really has no place here. If you want to be important, treat others as more important. If you want to win, you got to be willing to come in last. Now, those words were countercultural then, and they're countercultural now. They always have been. These words from Jesus are the reason that we talk around here about servant leadership. They're why we offer service opportunities every Saturday morning. They're why we plan a serve day each September when we replace our usual Sunday morning worship gatherings, when we don't come in here like this, but we go out there and we serve our community in a number of different ways. These words of Jesus are why we challenge our life groups to serve together. They're why we encourage every member of our church family to find a place of ministry. We want to do what Jesus called great, so we serve. But, but, and this is too important to miss, we don't just serve because that's what Jesus said. We serve because that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just tell his disciples he thought it would be a good idea for them to serve. He went on to say this in verse 45. He said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus' whole life was characterized by humility. I mean, think about it. The Lord of creation humbled himself by confining himself to a human body, and not just any human body, but a tiny baby. He was born into this world in a space that was shared with livestock, and he was laid in a feeding trough. His first visitors were blue-collar shepherds. He was raised in a very simple, modest home. He spent his ministry years essentially homeless. He spent a lot of his time with society's outcasts, the poor, the sick tax collectors, and prostitutes. He washed his disciples' feet. He was wrongfully executed like a criminal alongside men who were actually guilty of the crimes they were accused of, and his body was placed in a borrowed tomb. I mean, Jesus demonstrated repeatedly that first place is at the back of the line, and we strive to follow his example. We strive to make servanthood a core value. In our GROW pathway, which is the, the onboarding class we offer every single month, we stress that we are contributors, not consumers. So we stretch beyond our comfort and our campus to show others who Jesus is. And that means something very important. That means that we don't just serve when it's a planned, programmed church activity. It means that we strive to love our neighbors by going out of our way to help others wherever we see that need. And that's an important part of who we are as a church. 
But I want to tell you this morning that it's important that we not stop even there. Because if we allow ourselves to think that following Jesus simply means being a do-gooder, we miss the boat. It's a good thing to donate canned food. And you, we, collectively over the last several months have given tons and tons of canned food to the inner church food pantry. It's a great thing to build houses for Habitat for Humanity or to rake leaves for widows or to help our neighbors find their missing pets or to adopt families for Christmas. I'm loving right now that we're, we're on our way to about 90 families being adopted for Christmas this year through Operation Care. I love all of that. But I want us to notice together that when Jesus described his mission, he didn't stop with the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. He went on to say this, and to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life as a ransom for many. Now, when we hear the word ransom, we usually think of a kidnapper who abducts someone and then demands money to free them, right? The Greek word here that's translated ransom is a word that means the price of release. It was a word that in, in this day and age, in this context, was often used to describe money that was paid to purchase freedom for a slave, which is actually a great metaphor because spiritual bondage really has been humanity's biggest issue since the very beginning. God created in the very beginning a man and a woman to live in relationship with him and to begin populating the earth. He gave them a beautiful garden to live in and plenty of food. But because genuine relationship always requires a choice, God also introduced into that garden one off-limits tree. And at the prompting, the urging of the devil, disguised as a snake, Adam and Eve stepped outside of that one boundary God had given them, and they ate the forbidden fruit. And the book of Genesis tells us that in that moment, everything changed. They suddenly became very uncomfortably aware of their nakedness and their guilt. Their personal interaction with God changed as they tried to hide from him. They were kicked out of the garden, and they were cut off from access to the tree of life. And the distance that they experienced between themselves and God just made everything about life more difficult. Work got harder. Childbirth became more painful. Conflict became the norm, and death became an inescapable part of life. That moment in the book of Genesis is often referred to as the fall of man. And right then and there, in Genesis chapter 3, God promised that he would send a savior who would crush the devil. But you and I know in hindsight that that savior would be a long time in coming. Now those details aren't just plot points. In an ancient story from half a world away, they are an explanation of why our world is the way it is. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 5, that sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, Paul says, death came to all people because all sinned. In other words, Adam and Eve were only the first to do something that we have all done repeatedly, and that's to ignore God's instructions. Scripture calls that sin and insists that we are all guilty of it. Adam and Eve's sin distanced them from God, and the result was death. And the same is true for us. Paul said just a bit later in the book of Romans that the wages of sin is death. Not just that moment when these bodies give out and we stop breathing oxygen. He's talking about total, eternal separation from God in hell. That is the natural outcome of our sin. That is the paycheck that we earn through our disobedience to God. Because of sin, Scripture insists repeatedly that the world that God initially created perfect is now full of brokenness, disease, dysfunction, despair, conflict, and crime, and pollution, and poverty, and selfishness, and slavery, and hatred. I mean, the list is long and painful, but on that list, our ultimate enemy is death. Despite amazing advances in medicine and technology and safety and security, I'm sure you've noticed that everyone still dies. So Jesus came to do something more than heal diseases. 
He came to do more than feed the poor or end slavery or just make people happy for a few decades. He came, in his own words, to give his life as a ransom for many. To pay the price of our release from the curse of sin and death. And that raises an interesting question about, well, whom did Jesus pay that ransom to? You know, there are some who look at this passage of Scripture and they suggest that Jesus, with his life, paid a ransom to Satan, which sort of assumes that the devil has the power to make demands of and negotiate with God when he is not at all God's equal. I think the point here is that Jesus' sacrifice was God personally paying the price to put things right. I mean, you and I get when we watch a ball game that the referees are not going to catch every infraction of the rules. We're going to watch a Colts game this afternoon and we're going to be frustrated by some things that get called or some things that get missed. We get that the police don't catch every criminal, but God's justice is perfect and God's justice requires punishment for every sin. If God were to sometimes choose to let sin slide, that would mean that he's no longer consistent or perfect in his holiness and his goodness. So the point of scripture, the point of the gospel is that you and I will pay personally for our sins unless someone else bears those consequences for us. And that is exactly what Jesus did. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, this is a mouthful, but I love this statement. He says, righteousness the state of being in a right relationship with God is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance or in his patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In other words, Paul is saying that all people, no matter who we are, are guilty of sin. But through Jesus... At the cross, God saw to it that every sin, past, present, and future, was paid for. God, in his holiness, insisted that every sin has to be punished, and he took that punishment personally for us. Because that's how loving and kind and gracious and merciful God is. And the way that you and I can be made right with God in spite of our sin is by trusting in what Jesus did for us. Now this is a time of year, I'm sure you experience this the same way that I do, when decorating and baking and Hallmark movies and shopping and wrapping of presents often tend to occupy a lot of our focus. And there's nothing wrong with those things inherently. Hallmark movies might be debatable. But whatever you want to put on that list, that isn't Christmas. We celebrate Christmas for one reason, and that is because our world is broken and God sent a Savior. Which means that nothing is more important than for you and me to be made right with God. And Jesus came because of what Scripture insists about all of us. Which means that even without knowing all of the nuances and all the, the nitty-gritty details of your life, I know there are certain statements that are as true of you as they are of me. For example, we are sinners. In a variety of ways, we have neglected what God calls good, and we have pursued our own pleasure instead. And in the process, we have hurt other people, and we have corrupted ourselves, and we have dishonored God. Have you owned up to the sin in your life? Scripture says this is something we all have to acknowledge. At the same time, number two, Scripture insists that we are loved. God created you. He created me for a relationship with him. He doesn't want us to live our lives enslaved to sin. 
He doesn't want us to spend eternity separated from him. No matter what anyone else has said about you or about me, God, the one who matters most, the one who made us, loves us. And so that paves the way for a third very important statement, and that is that we can be forgiven. Jesus had no sin of his own, but he took our guilt on himself and he suffered and died to pay our ransom. The price of our release in full. Which means that no matter what you've done wrong in the past, no matter what flavor of sin you may be living in right here in the present, Jesus has already paid for it. And because of Jesus, our guilt doesn't have to mean separation from God. So here's a question that's important for us to ask every single day of the year, but never any more important than right here at Christmas time. Have you trusted Jesus personally to restore you to God? Have you personally accepted the price that he paid for you? I mean, if you know that the consequence of sin is to be cut off from God forever, and you understand that Jesus loves you and with his own life paid the price to ransom and free you, then you know that nothing is more urgent than trusting Jesus. To admit your sin, to tell the truth about who Jesus is, to ask him to make you new, to be united with him in baptism, to turn your life away from the way you've been living and toward him and walk with him from this point on. The point of Christmas is to follow Jesus and to share his story. And this is true every single day of the year, but never any more true than it is right here at Christmas time. We are here to help you do that. Bobby mentioned in a video before the service, you can go to greenwoodchristian.com slash next steps and you can let us know there that you'd like to talk to someone that you want to learn more about Jesus, that you're ready to be baptized, that you'd like to get more involved in Greenwood Christian Church, or you fill in the blank. Go to that site, let us know how we can help you, and a member of our staff will follow up with you quickly. And if you want to talk to somebody today, there will be a few of us available at the back of the room in just a moment, right after we pray. Whatever your next step is, there's nothing more important you could do today or any other day than to act on that, to trust Jesus, the one who came from God to pay our ransom and to make us right with our Heavenly Father. I'm so glad you're here today. Would you pray with me? And if we can help you to take a next step, go to that site or find us at the back. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful for your love for us. Thank you for paying our ransom. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus came that he suffered and died in a way he did not deserve to so that we could experience a a kind of unity with you that we don't deserve in light of our sins. God, we're thankful for your grace and your mercy. And the second and third and fourth chances, Father, that you've made available to us because of that. Lord, we ask that at this time of year when life tends to get busy, when our our list of details to attend to before a, a certain date gets here, tends to get longer and longer. Father, help us to put first things first. And Lord, help us to make certain that at your invitation, we're in a right relationship with you. Lord, whatever it is that we need to do in order to accept that invitation, in order to receive that gift, Lord, we ask you to help us to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name.
Hey there, friends. At different times, we all wonder where we came from and why we're here and where our lives are even headed. Well, here at Greenwood Christian, we believe that Jesus is the key to all of those questions. He created us to live in relationship with him and with others. He loved us enough to give his life on the cross to pay for our sins and restore us to a right relationship. And he rose from the dead to free us to live with power and with purpose. Our world desperately needs Jesus. And so we want to share him with as many people as we possibly can. So it's crucial that we know Jesus. Uh, the Bible isn't just a book of moral instructions and strange sounding names. It's actually the story of Jesus. And we want to know him. And we, are, we want to be able to clearly tell others about him. So it's crucial that we know scripture. But the ultimate point of knowing scripture is to help us obey Jesus. Not just to know about him, but to actually do what he says. James chapter 1 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And that's why we're going to devote all of 2021 to a study called Core 52. This is a book that was written by Mark Moore. Mark was one of my Bible college professors. He's currently a teaching pastor in Phoenix. Mark loves Jesus and he is a brilliant Bible scholar and teacher. I read Core 52 a few months ago and I'm really excited to be able to reread it with all of you. Each Sunday, just like we always do, we're going to teach from a section of scripture. And then throughout the following week, Core 52 will help us to internalize and remember and put God's word into practice. Now, here's what you can do to join us on this journey. First of all, you're gonna to wanna to pick up a copy of the Core 52 book. We'll make those available to you in the Commons starting November 29th, or you are, of course, free to order one from Amazon or christianbook.com or wherever you purchase books. You can download it for an e-reader if you'd rather do things that way. Our goal is for everyone in our church family, sixth grade and older, to have a copy of the book. Now, if money is tight, just consider the book a gift from us. If you're able and willing to donate $20 or whatever you can afford, you'll help us to defray the cost of putting this book in the hands of as many people as possible. Now, in addition to the Core 52 book, you may also find helpful a bookmark we'll give you that will help you to stay on track. We're going to scramble up the sequence of the book just a little bit to help us better align with Easter and Christmas. And this bookmark will help you throughout all of next year to keep tabs on your progress. We also have some scripture memory cards. And you may find that keeping these on your desk or on your mirror, on your dashboard, on your dinner table, and reviewing them periodically will help you in the scripture memorization process. Unlike many other devotionals, Core 52 is going to ask us to do more than just do some reading each day. Each week, we're going to be given five assignments. One of them will be a short essay to read. That will be followed by a few passages of scripture for us to meditate on, to think about, to memorize. And then each week, there will be an action step for us to put into practice. Most of these exercises will take 15 minutes or less. And if you're an overachiever type, you're really going to be thrilled to know that there's some additional bonus reading assignments that you can find at the end of each chapter. I'm looking forward to 2021. As a follower of Jesus and as a Bible teacher, I'm really excited about the way Core 52 is going to help us to integrate Scripture into our lives. So I hope you'll join us for this series throughout the coming year. Well, as Matt said, we're looking forward to uh, Core 52 here in a couple of weeks. If you haven't picked up a book yet, you can do so in the comments today. Um, there will be a bookmark in uh, each book you pick up here, but if you've ordered one on Amazon or you're going to do an e-read or any of that kind of stuff, there are additional bookmarks out there. You can grab one on your way out. Uh, also, if you're joining us online and you know you're just not going to be in the building in the next couple of weeks, you can fill out a form on our website and we'll deliver one to you by the end of the year. And also, if you're looking for an easy way to invite uh, folks to Christmas Eve, there are some invitation cards out in the comments uh, today. We hope you have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday.